Before we come to Prime Minister's questions, I would like to point out that the British Sign Language Interpretation Proceedings is available to watch on Parliament Live TV. We now come to questions to the Prime Minister. I start with Robin Miller. Mr Speaker, from tomorrow... Up a minute. Shh. Come. Give me the word in. Order! Order! I say to the honourable gentleman, give me this. I will not tolerate such behaviour. If you want to go out, go out now, but if you stand again, I will order you out. Make your mind up. Either shut up and get out. Up a minute. Does somebody want to <clears throat> do what wants? Give me the Order, order. Sit down, you want me in the future. I now warn of the honourable members that if they persist in refusing to comply with my order to withdraw, I shall be content compelled to name both of them, which may lead to them being suspended from the House. Right, names. To ensure that the Honourable Member complies. Can it... <coughs> Where's the names? I order... Shut up. Shh. Neil Hanvey, I am now naming you and Kenny McCaskill to leave this chamber. Sergeant, deal with them. Deal with them. <coughs> deal with them. Just sit down. Out. No. Sergeant at arms, escort them out. <laughs> Take them out, Sergeant. Let them out. Can we... Insurrection. Yeah, just put the again. No, then let's just see if we can. <laughs> Mr. Costa, you don't want to go and escort them to the tea room, do you? <laughs> no, I suggest not. I think you're a good and better behaved than that. Right, we'll try again after that. Prime Minister, Prime Minister we'll now go to Robin Miller. Yeah. Mr Speaker, from tomorrow, the first instalment of the cost of living payment will start landing in the bank accounts of 8 million households across the country. This is a much-needed £326 cash boost uh, for families and forms part of the 1200 indirect support that we're giving to the most vulnerable households this year. Mr Speaker, I'm sure the whole House was appalled and saddened, as I was, to hear about the despicable attack on Shinzo Abe. Yeah. Our thoughts are with his family and loved ones and the people of Japan at this dark and sad time. Yeah. Mr Speaker, this week we remember the genocide in Srebrenica and the victims of those appalling events. We must learn the lessons of history and do all in our power to prevent such a thing happening again. Yeah. We will continue to combat war crime deniers, both in Bosnia, Herzegovina and elsewhere. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Yeah. Robin Miller. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Prime Minister for his personal interest in Aberconwy? Whether he's been eating ice cream on the pier in Llandidno, sampling Welsh Penderian whisky, or standing on the granite quarry in Penmine Mawr. Yeah. He's, he's seen why they love this constituency. He's also heard from them their gratitude for the vaccine and furlough programmes that this UK government delivered. So will my right honourable friend now support our plan to level up Aberconwy and our bid for almost £20 million of funding to invest in community and cultural programmes and give us the opportunity to match our potential? 
Uh, I thank my honourable friend, and he's a great champion for, uh, for Abercrombie. And I, I much enjoyed the, the Penderin whisky uh, that we uh, sampled uh, together. The, Mr. Speaker, I, I ignored the revolver, as some of you uh, may have noticed. Uh, we, are, we are committed to uniting and levelling up the UK. And uh, as for the second round of the levelling up fund announcements, it will be uh, coming, Mr. Speaker, this autumn. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, may I join the Prime Minister on his comments about the former Prime Minister of Japan, a deeply shocking moment, and of course his comments about genocide. Mr Speaker, may I welcome the new Cabinet to their places? We have a new Chancellor who accepted a job from the Prime Minister on Wednesday afternoon and then told him to quit on Thursday morning. A new, a new Northern Ireland Secretary who once asked if you need a passport to get to Derry. <laughs> and the new Education Secretary whose junior ministers have literally been giving the middle finger to the public. It is truly the country's loss that they will only be in post for a few weeks. <laughs> now, the Prime Minister must be feeling demo puppy since he was pushed out of office. Finally, he can throw off the shackles, say what he really thinks, and forget about following the rules. <laughs> so, does he agree? Does he agree it's time to scrap the absurd non dom status that allows the super rich to dodge tax in this country? Yeah. Prime Minister, well, I, could I, I thank you very much, and uh, it's perfectly true that. Uh, I, I'm grateful for uh, the ability to speak my mind, which I never really uh, lost, Mr Speaker. But what I'm focusing on is continuing the government of the, of the country. And as, as I've just told you, Mr Speaker, tomorrow, from tomorrow, £326 is arriving... Never mind non-doms, Mr Speaker. I, doms, doms or non-doms, I don't mind. Uh, £326 is arriving, is arriving in the bank accounts of 8 million vulnerable people. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and how can we do that? Uh, because we took the decisions uh, to get the strong economy that we currently have that I'm afraid uh, were resisted uh, by. Sorry, growth, growth in May at 0.5%, yeah. Mr Speaker, uh, which, which they weren't expecting. We have seen... As I've told you before, Mr Speaker, 620,000 more people in, pay, in payroll employment than before the pandemic uh, began. And one of the consolations of leaving office at this particular time, Mr Speaker, is that vacancies are at an all-time high. Yes, Dharma. Uh, uh, cu cut him some slack. Faced with an uncertain future, a mortgage-sized decorator's bill uh, that will be soon for somebody else's flat... I'm not surprised he's careful not to upset any future employers. So here's an even simpler one. Does he agree that offshore schemes can pose a risk because some people use them to avoid tax they owe here? Yeah. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I'm proud of the investment that this country uh, attracts from, uh, from around the world. And uh, he's talking about uh, people from offshore people investing in the UK. Uh, I'm absolutely thrilled uh, to see uh, that we've had, I think, £12 billion in tech alone uh, come in in the, last, in the last, couple of, uh, last couple of months. I think it's possible, Mr Speaker, he's referring uh, not to me, uh, but to uh, some of the eight brilliant candidates who are currently vying uh, for my job. Let me, just tell, let, me just tell him that, let me just tell him that any one of them will wipe the floor with Captain... Yeah. Captain... Yeah. Yeah. Wipe the floor. Can I just say, the furniture has to be repaired. And one of the members has already had one bill. I'm sure he doesn't want another. Prime Minister. Any one of them would wipe the floor with Captain Crasheroonie's snooze fest, uh, Mr Speaker. <laughs> And, and after a few weeks' time, uh, that is exactly what they will do. They will unite around the winner and do just that. Yeah. Yes, Starmer. He's been saying all week that he wants revenge on those that have wronged him. Uh, here's an idea, Prime Minister. If he, if he really wants to hit them where it hurts, he should tighten the rules on tax avoidance. Yeah. But at the very least, does he agree that anyone running to be Prime Minister 
should declare where they and their families have been domiciled for tax purposes mm. and whether they have ever been a beneficiary of an offshore tax scheme. Yeah. 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 Prime Minister. Mr. Sp- Mr Speaker, to, to the best of my knowledge, uh, everybody in this Parliament, uh, everybody in this House, uh, pays their full whack of tax in this country. And I think that people should, uh, members, ac- members across the House should, be, uh, should, be, uh, should cease this constant vilification uh, of each other. I think people pay their fair share of taxes uh, and, and quite right. Uh, what we're doing, and it's thanks to the tax yield uh, that we have had, uh, that we're able to support the people of this country in the way uh, that we are. Uh, so, so we've been able to increase uh, universal credit uh, by a £1,000, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, we're putting £356 into the, to, from tomorrow into the bank accounts of those uh, who need it most, Mr Speaker. And uh, thanks to the policies we have pursued, as I have just uh, told you, uh, we have unemployment at or near record lows. And that is what counts, Mr Speaker. No, they are very happy to see people languish on benefits. We believe in getting people into good jobs. And, and, and I'm looking for one. Mr Speaker, I'm not sure he's been keeping up with what's happening in the last few days. Over the weekend, the candidates to replace him have promised £330 billion in giveaways. That's, that's roughly double the annual budget for the NHS. Sadly, they haven't found time to explain how they're paying for it, I, even though one of them's the Chancellor and another one was Chancellor until a week ago. They all backed 15 tax rises. Now they're acting as if they've just arrived from the moon, saying it should never have happened. Doesn't he agree that rather than desperately rewriting history, they should at least explain exactly where they're getting all this cash from? Prime Minister. Actually, Mr Speaker, he's, co- he's completely right. I've been listening very, I've been listening very carefully, and uh, all the, all the uh, commitments that I'm listening to are very, are very clear. We will continue, whoever is elected will continue uh, to put more police out on the street, exactly as we, exactly as we promised. Already at 13,576, we're going to go up to 20,000. Uh, whoever takes over will build. They always complain about this, but we will build the 40 new hospitals, Mr Speaker. Uh, and, and I, I asked my... I asked my delivery unit yesterday. Well, they don't want it. They don't like it, Mr. Speaker, because they voted against the funding. They voted against the funding uh, that makes it possible, Mr. Speaker. And, and they have also, in, just in the last, in, just in the last period in which he has been in office, made extra commitments of public spending worth 94 billion pounds, which would be thousands of pounds of extra taxation for every family in the country, Mr. Speaker. That's the difference between them and us. Yes, Totally, totally deluded to the bitter end. Now, now, to be fair, oh, oh. Mr. Alden, I think that's the last time I hear from you today. I think otherwise you might be able to buy a couple of other people cups of tea. To be fair to the new Chancellor, he's at least attempted to spell it out. He's promised tens of billions in tax cuts, and confirm he would cut the NHS, the police and school budgets by 20% to fund it. The member for Stratford and Gibraltar is complaining, but he said it on TV. And yesterday, yesterday he said, it's simply not right that families are seeing their bills skyrocket and we do nothing. Was the Chancellor speaking on behalf of the Government, Prime Minister, when he promised huge spending cuts and when he said that they are doing nothing on the cost of living crisis? Prime Minister. Uh, look, 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 Mr Speaker, this is really a, a piti- pitiful stuff from the, the party, the party that, that voted against the £39 billion pounds uh, which is necessary to pay for those 50,000 uh, nurses uh, which we're recruiting and we, and we will recruit by 2024, Mr Speaker, which is necessary to pay for those hospitals and uh, those doctors and those scans and that treatment. They don't, they don't have a leg to, to stand on, Mr Speaker. And, and, the, and I can tell him something else. The reason, the reason we've got growth now at uh, 0.5% in May is, is because we took the tough 
decisions to come out of uh, lockdown on July the 19th last year, which he said was reckless. Ms. Never forget, he said it was reckless. We, our economy, would not be strong enough now to make the payments we are to our fantastic NHS, and they know it. Yeah. I really am going to miss this weekly nonsense from him. <laughs> let's, let's move on. Let's move on from his current Chancellor to his former Chancellor. Last week he resigned, accusing the Prime Minister of not conducting government properly, competently or seriously. He suggested the Prime Minister is not prepared to work hard or take difficult decisions and implied that the Prime Minister cannot tell the public the truth. Yesterday, he claimed his big plan is to rebuild the economy. Now, even the Prime Minister must be impressed by that Johnsonian brass neckery. <laughs> Can the Prime Minister think of any jobs his former Chancellor may have had that means he bears some responsibility for an economy that he now claims is broken? <laughs> Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, 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 look, I think everybody who's played a part in uh, the last uh, three years has done a, uh, a remarkable job in helping this country through very difficult times. Uh, I, I just want to say to him, really, uh, this may, if Mr Speaker, the next leader of, uh, of, the, of my party may be elected by acclamation, so it's possible uh, this will be our last, uh, our last confrontation over this. It's, it's, it's possible. So I want to thank him. I want to thank him for the style in which he's conducted himself. I think it would be fair to say he's been considerably less lethal uh, than many other members of this House. Uh, this and I'll tell you why that is. I'll tell you why that is. Because he hasn't come up. Can I just say to this end of this front bench, I expect better behaviour, and I'm certainly going to get it. Prime Minister. Yeah. Uh, there's a reason for that, Mr Speaker. It's over, over three years, in spite of every opportunity, he's never really come up with an idea, a plan or a vision uh, for, this, for this country. Uh, and I can tell you uh, that at the, end of, at the end of three years, Mr Speaker, we got Brexit done, which he voted against 48 times. We delivered the first vaccine in the world and rolled it out faster than any other yeah. European country, which will never possibly be listened to him, Mr Speaker. And we played a decisive role in helping to protect the people of Ukraine from the brutal invasion of Vladimir Putin and helped to save Ukraine, Mr Speaker. And I'm proud to say that we are continuing, and every one of the eight candidates will continue, with the biggest ever programme of infrastructure, skills and technology yes. across this country to level up in a way in a way that will benefit the constituents of every member of this House, Mr Speaker. And it's perfectly true, it's perfectly true that I leave not at a time of my choosing. And it's uh, uh, absolutely true. But I am, I am proud of the fantastic teamwork that has been involved in all of those projects, both nationally and, and internationally, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, and I'm also proud of the leadership that I have given. And I will be leaving, Mr Speaker, I will be leaving soon with my head held high. The convicted double child rapist and murderer of Colin Pitchfork was granted parole last year by the Independent Parole Board in the face of enormous opposition. Prime Minister, you and I have communicated about this matter on numerous occasions, and you have assured me that you would do everything in your power to deal with this situation. Can you confirm, before you leave office, that your government will make all the necessary submissions that it can make lawfully to the Independent Parole Board to make sure that this dangerous man is kept behind bars. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Prime thank my honourable friend for his campaign. Our thoughts, of course, with the victims of Pitchfork, uh, uh, with Lydia, 
uh, and Dawn's friends and family. And, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I can tell the House that uh, my rival friend, the Deputy Prime Minister, will be submitting his views on the Pitchfork case uh, to the Parole Board uh, before his hearing. And uh, there is also, as the House will know, a root and branch review of the parole system currently underway, uh, which includes plans for greater uh, ministerial oversight for the most serious offenders. And we'll be bringing that forward as soon as parliamentary time allows. We now come to the Leader of the SNP, Ian Black. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister in the murder of Shinzo Abe, a dreadful event that took place last weekend? Can I also thank you, Mr Speaker, for hosting last night the charity Remembering Srebrenica? We should all take time this week on the 27th anniversary of the genocide that took place there to think of the circumstances and the shame that we were not able to step in and stop the murder of so many innocent boys and men and the rape of so many women. And that we must learn the lessons from that. And of course at this time we think very much of those in Ukraine that are facing a war criminal and make sure that those responsible are ultimately held to account for crimes against humanity. Mr Speaker, the Tory leadership contest is quickly descending into a toxic race to the right. And it's clear that whoever wins that race, Scotland loses. The former Chancellor has pledged to govern like Margaret Thatcher. The current Chancellor is threatening 20% cuts to the NHS and public services. And they're all trying to outdo each other on an extreme Brexit, costing the economy billions. Is the real reason that the Prime Minister won't endorse any of these awful candidates? Because whoever becomes the next Tory leader will make Genghis Khan look like a moderate. Uh, well, I, I, I'm so, I, I'm so I, I feel a real twinge, Mr. Speaker, that this is uh, probably all, virtually the last time I'll have the opportunity to, uh, to answer a question to the, the perhaps because he's going or because I'm going, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, Mr. Speaker, I, all, all I would say to him is that uh, I think that the uh, next uh, leader of, of my party. Uh, will uh, want to make sure that we do everything we can to work with the, uh, the Scottish Government in the way that I've been able to do, I'm proud to have done over the last uh, uh, few years, to protect and secure our union. And uh, my, my strong view, Mr Speaker, having listened to him very carefully uh, for years and years now, is that we are much, much better together. Ian Blackford. I can say with all sincerity, I hope whoever is the next Tory leader will be as popular in Scotland as he has been. <laughs> For people in Scotland, Westminster has never looked so out of touch. We've got right-wing Tory contenders prioritising tax cuts for the rich and a zombie UK government failing to tackle the cost of living crisis. Whilst the Tories are busy tearing lump outs of each other, money-saving expert Martin Lewis has warned the energy price cap could soon rise by a sickening 65% in October to £3,244 a year. After a decade of Tory cuts and Brexit price rises, it will mean many families simply can't afford to put food on the table and heat their homes. Scotland literally can't afford the cost of living with Westminster. Does the Prime Minister not get that people in Scotland don't just want rid of him, they want rid of the whole rotten Westminster system? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, actually, I think that's not what is actually happening in this country, is that we're using the the fiscal firepower that we built up to, to cut taxes uh, for, for working people, cut taxes for those on low incomes, and uh, you saw that last week uh, in the 300, average of £330 uh, tax cut of, uh, on national insurance. We're increasing support for those uh, vulnerable households uh, from tomorrow, another £326 uh, going in. Uh, and Mr Speaker, it's thanks to our union. Uh, that we were able to, uh, we were able to deliver uh, the furlough scheme, which helped uh, the entire country, and uh, to make the, the, the massive transfers uh, that boost the whole of the UK economy. And I think uh, that the people of the last thing the people of Scotland uh, need now, uh, and the last thing the people of the last thing they need is more constitutional wrangling uh, when uh, we need to fix the economy. Mary Robinson. Yeah. Mr Speaker, after securing almost £14 million in my town's fund bid for Cheadle, I was delighted last week to get the green light for our new Cheadle rail station. Yeah. Yeah. 
and £4 million for our state-of-the-art eco-business park. Ah. I've had tremendous support from the Cheadle Towns Board and local community who understand how important it is to have connected towns and villages bringing investment and high-tech jobs to our area. I'm ambitious for Cheadle and now want to secure the redoubling of the Mid-Cheshire Line and the extension of Metrolink through my constituency. Will my right honourable friend join me in thanking the Towns Board and Station Working Group for their support and agree with me that improving connectivity is key to economic growth and the future of our levelling of yeah. the well, Mr. Speaker, it's thanks to the massive exertions of this government in levelling up uh, with the £650 billion investment in, uh, in infrastructure uh, that we're uh, up. We haven't got a new railway station in Cheadle, uh, for instance, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I'm, I know that the bids that uh, my honourable friend has just mentioned are now being actively uh, studied by the Department for Transport, and uh, she should feed in more to them. Stephen Farrett. Thank you. In a recent opinion poll conducted by Lucid Talk for Queen's University, only 5% of the people of Northern Ireland expressed any trust whatsoever in this government. So as the Prime Minister prepares to leave office shortly, will he apologise for his legacy in Northern Ireland, in which power sharing has collapsed, the Good Friday Agreement has been undermined, an unwanted protocol bill has been imposed upon the people and businesses of Northern Ireland, and Anglo-Irish relations are in their worst state for 40 years? Prime Minister. Well, Mr. No, Mr. Speaker, because actually what we've got, and I know that every single one of the uh, candidates will want to uh, deliver this, is a bill to, to fix the problem of the, of the protocol. And, uh, and I accept that there is, a, uh, there is a problem, and I hope that the whole House will, uh, will support it. Jacob Young. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And as this is probably the last time I'll get to address the Prime Minister at this dispatch box. Can I say on behalf of the people of Red Green Cleveland how grateful we are for the support that he's given us and for, and for delivering on the will of 17.4 million people in taking us out of the EU. Can I ask the Prime Minister, is he as optimistic as I am about our future as a free and independent nation? Jacob, I mean, uh, my, my, my honourable friend, if anything, I think it's... I'm even, I'm even more optimistic, and uh, my only anxiety. Uh, we all know that people think that this will be. There are people around the world who hope that this will be the end of the end of Brexit, and uh, I can see them all. Oh, look at them! Did you, see, did you notice? Did you notice? That's them. That's them. They're wrong, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to show that they're wrong. We now come to Martin Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, if the UK truly is a voluntary union of equal nations. There must be a democratic way for any of those member nations to withdraw from it. But at what rate does the PM think the role of the UK government is to decide whether to respect the mandate given by the people of Scotland to their government and endorsed by their parliament? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, as I, as I continually advise the, the members of the Scottish National Party, or Nationalist Party, I should say, uh, they should look at what is happening at educational standards in Scotland, which they are responsible for, which they are responsible for uh, instead, instead of endlessly asking uh, for a repeat of a, of a constitutional uh, co event that we had in 2014. We had a vote, Mr Speaker, they lost. Catherine Fletcher. Yeah. The Prime Minister knows how proud we are of our industrial heritage in the north of England and what it means for our future. So last Friday it was a joy to be on the banks of the Ribble with the Friends of the Old Tram Bridge, a group that are asking for this historic piece of industrial architecture that crosses the Ribble to be reopened. Vote for the utility and because we're bloody proud of it. So, does the Prime Minister hope to share my hope that Preston City Council will include the plans to get the bridge reopened as part of their levelling up fund bid? Yeah. Prime Minister. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I think it's probably, probably fair to say that I'm, I'm responsible for building more, more, more river crossings than anybody else in this, uh, in this house, uh, uh, including uh, and bridges. Uh, including Suggett's Lane, Suggett's Lane crossing, Mr. Speaker, which I delivered uh, for, for my honourable friend. Uh, I, I think at this stage in my political career, I could not, in all, in, in all honesty, promise that I can deliver this bridge, uh, Mr. Speaker. But I think, I think that, she, that she has eight people to whom uh, she could direct that request uh, right now. And I, 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 she's in a strong bargaining position. Uh, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Let's double, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. 
Child poverty has increased in every part of Wales in the last seven years under Tory cuts to public services and malign welfare policies. In the communities I represent, 37% of children are now growing up in poverty. He has one last chance to make a real difference to these children's lives before he leaves office. Will he scrap the two-child limit and reinstate the £20 uplift for all families entitled to welfare? Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Mr Speaker, of course the Labour government in Wales is responsible for schools, but what we have been doing, uh, what we have been doing is not only uh, increasing the, uh, the living wage by £1,000, uh, providing the, the financial support, the £37 billion worth of financial support uh, that I have uh, I've mentioned, but uh, helping councils, uh, Mr Speaker, with a £1.5 billion uh, household uh, support fund uh, to get the families such as those uh, she mentions uh, through uh, the tough times, and we will come out very strongly on uh, the other side. We now come to a close question, Sir Mike Penning. Number eight, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, Minister. I thank my honourable friend. I am delighted that there will be a new hospital scheme in this area. I am told that the local hospital trust have considered a full range of options, and that they consider that new hospital builds at Watford General alongside further investment at Hemel, Hempstead and St Albans hospitals represent the best option for health services in the area. Sir Mike Penning. Can I thank the Prime Minister for delivering Brexit and the fantastic vaccine rollout programme yeah. that I was proud to be involved with and save so many lives in my constituents and around the country. Sadly, the Trust have not considered all options, and then my constituents will be astonished as to what they have said by saying that they now want one point two billion pounds for the refurbished tower block situation in Watford. So can the Prime Minister do me a great favour before he leaves? Can he put a little note in the drawer of number ten? So when the new incumbent comes in to say Penning needs a new hospital and a greenfield site. <laughs> Uh, well, Mr. Speaker, I can tell him that I'll, he can get, he, I will assure he gets uh, a meeting with the relevant minister to discuss his proposals. John Trickett. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, we now know that every ambulance service in the whole country is in a critical state. But last week, well before the current national heatwave emergency, my constituent, Mrs. Meacham, died following waiting for hours for an ambulance in an in excruciating and prolonged delay. Her daughter tells me that the family, family tragedy wasn't called, caused by the staff, but by cutbacks by this government. But in any event, without immediate and drastic action, we cannot be sure that there will be more, many more Mrs Meachams. Does the PM accept we now are living through an emergency health crisis? And given the disastrous state he's leaving the NHS in, why is he still in Downing Street? Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, the uh, NHS now has a record, he, he talks about staffing levels, the NHS now has a record number of, uh, of people working in it, 10,900 more nurses this year than there were last year, 6,000 more, uh, more doctors. And on ambulances, which, and he's right, it's absolutely critical, uh, the, the, the crucial thing is to, is to help the hospital staff to move patients through the system. And too often, I'm afraid, it is impossible because a proportion of the patients, sadly, are in a delayed uh, discharge, and that is making life very, very difficult for the ambulances as they come up uh, to hospitals. But that is why it is so crucial that this government, in addition to everything else we've done, Mr Speaker, is fixing social care right. and, helping, and helping patients out of hospital. And that's why we put in the £39 billion, pounds, Mr Speaker, uh, which, unfortunately, uh, his party voted against. Brereton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah, Can yeah. I thank the Prime Minister for all he's done to help level up Stoke-on-Trent? Yeah. 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 The, the number of workless households in our city has halved under the last, over the last decade of Conservatives in government. So would my right hon. Friend agree that the best way to level up Stoke-on-Trent is to get more people in well-skilled, better-paid employment yeah. opportunities? I, I think he's absolutely right. And the right hon. Gentleman knows a lot more about Stoke-Newington than he knows about Stoke. And that's, uh, that, 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 
that is absolutely true, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, I, uh, and I'm proud that we're getting people, young people, into work. I was up and down the country. I was at an event last night uh, to celebrate the 163,000 uh, Kickstarters uh, who we've helped uh, into work. And that is our ambition to help people into good jobs. And, and we are succeeding. I'm proud to say I leave office, Mr. Speaker, with unemployment at roughly 3.8%. When they laughed at last left office, it was at 8%. That's the difference. Between them and us. You're Malcolm MacDonald. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last night's panorama with the joint investigation with the Times newspaper has exposed yet again more evidence of unlawful killings by special forces, this time in Afghanistan. When this came up before, the government, and in particular the MOD, was determined to sweep this under the carpet. But those who serve in uniform and the public the protect deserve better than this. These aren't vexatious claims from campaigning lawyers. They come from within the armed forces themselves and indeed from our allies in Australia. So will the Prime Minister commit to an Australia-style independent inquiry as backed by General Lord Richards? But more broadly, hasn't the case been made again for democratic oversight of special forces? Prime Minister. Uh, well, uh, Mr Speaker, it's a, it's, it's a long-standing uh, practice, I think, accepted on both sides of this House, that we do not comment on, uh, on special forces. Uh, that does not mean uh, that we in any way accept the factual accuracy of the claims to which he is alluded. On the other hand, Mr Speaker, nor does it mean that anybody who serves in Her Majesty's Armed Forces is above the law. Can I, can I just warn other members that there is a subjudice on this? I allowed that question because it was very general, and that's the only way I would ever allow it to be discussed. At the Andrew Lewis. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, in the last few years, campaigning and persistence have led to the construction of a new children's A&E, and just this year a new main A&E for Northampton General Hospital in my constituency. Mm. Building on this success, what the town now needs is an urgent treatment centre. Does the Prime Minister agree that this would be a hugely welcome step in providing top quality health care in Northampton? Uh, Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, as I, as I mentioned I think earlier on, uh, we are engaged in a massive programme of uh, improvements and building and rebuilding in our, in our NHS estate. Uh, I think that, uh, with, with great respect to my uh, honourable friend, uh, this is a, a decision that he's going to have to continue to, to lobby for. I think the local NHS bodies uh, will, uh, will have, to, have to make up their, their minds on that one, but I'm sure he will continue to make uh, lively representations. Patricia Gibson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Last week, the Prime Minister was forced to announce his intention to resign after ministers who supported him only days earlier changed their minds. Of course, people are allowed to change their minds, and this should be recognised. Why does the Prime Minister and his MPs believe this principle applies everywhere except in Scotland, where the people delivered a clear mandate to the Scottish Parliament to hold an independence referendum? Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, as I understand it, the people of the SNP are currently deciding what to do uh, with my honourable friend. And heaven, heaven forfend that they should change their minds, Mr Speaker. Th Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, uh, 40 years ago, uh, 10 young people from Rugby's West Indian <coughs> community travelled to, to a house in New Cross Road, London, for a birthday celebration for Roma, former rugby resident Yvonne Ruddick. Tragically, there was a fire at the house where the party was held, and two of that group never returned home. Others were traumatised. The fire cost 13 people their lives and has been the subject of two inquests, both of which were inconclusive. Those who survived and the families of the bereaved are calling for a further investigation. I wonder if the Prime Minister would agree that the appointment of the new Metropolitan Police Commissioner provides an opportunity to re-examine the events of that time. Uh, Prime Minister. I thank my honourable friend, and I know from my own experience of running uh, the city uh, of the anguish that that particular uh, tragedy uh, caused, and I know the deep feeling uh, that surrounds it, Mr Speaker. I thank him uh, for, for raising it, and I can, I can tell him, uh, of course, that uh, whatever my own views, this is a matter for the independent uh, Metropolitan uh, Police Service, and I'm sure the new uh, Commissioner will be considering uh, what he has just said. Alan Brown. Uh, yeah. th thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
While he was editor of The Spectator, he published a poem about exterminating the Scotch, a verminous race. He previously stated that a pound spent in Croydon is of more value to the country than a pound spent <laughs> in Strathclyde. He called for an ending of the Barnet formula, and he stated an MP from a Scottish constituency shouldn't be a Prime Minister. So, given his anti-Scottish views, his abject failure as a Prime Minister, why did he think he's a right to try and block a democratic vote for Scotland to choose its future away from this corrupt Waste Minister? Yeah. Yeah. Can, I, can I just say to the, to the, the Honourable Gentleman that uh, after three years of listening to this uh, delirium of m- monotony uh, from the Scottish Nationalists, uh, I really think they need to change the record. Uh, what the people of this country want is a focus on the cost of living, a focus on the economy, and uh, making sure on schools, Mr Speaker, on standards in schools, those are things uh, that he should fix, Mr Speaker, uh, and, and to say nothing of the tragedy of drug deaths in Scotland, yeah. Mr Speaker, which they, still have, which, they still, which they still haven't done anything to address, Mr Speaker, uh, and everything I have seen has taught me uh, that we are far, far better, whether it's on Ukraine or COVID, Mr Speaker, or on furlough, uh, there is absolutely no doubt, Mr Speaker, that we are better off working together. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Kensington is at the heart of the Ukrainian community, and on their behalf, I would like to first send their huge thanks for your support to Ukraine. Yesterday was the first year anniversary of the devastating flooding that affected my constituency, with more than 1,000 homes affected, people in basement flats losing all of their belongings, and many people still in temporary accommodation. Would my right honourable friend back my fight to ensure that we get serious investment in infrastructure in West London from Thames Water? Yeah. Prime Minister, I, I, I thank her very much, and I, I, I know that uh, I know the problem is, uh, of where, uh, that she speaks of uh, very well. There is no single solution to tackling uh, surface water uh, flooding. Uh, but uh, she is absolutely right in wanting to put more pressure on uh, Thames Water to try to come up uh, with sustainable uh, solutions. Uh, but they have got to be done uh, working with, uh, with partners, with councils and, of course, uh, with developers as well. Final question, Sam Turry. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A few, a few short weeks ago, Zara Alina was walking home through Ilford. She was dragged off the street and brutally murdered. Zara's family made a touching tribute for her life. She was authentic, refused to try and impress anyone, but she impressed us. She was the rock of our family. Last week, on the 8th of July, another woman was stabbed in St John's Road, just yards from my family's church that I attended for 15 years, so I know like the back of my hand. Women in Ilford should not have to police themselves or impose curfews on their behaviour when they want to just go about their daily business. So, Mr Speaker, I want to know whether the Prime Minister will commit to greater allocation of funding in terms of policing that is targeted on specialist knife crime into Ilford and across all of that part of North East London. And in addition, Mr Speaker, what measures will this government actually take that will make a difference to the lives of women? Will they toughen sentences for rape, stalking, domestic violence and put in place proper police support to end, Mr Speaker, the epidemic of violence in this country against women and girls? Just before the Prime Minister answers. Sorry. Just to say, it's a very important, I've allowed it to raise, be careful of going into detail on the first name because it is sub judice, but in general terms, I'm sure that we can answer it. Prime Minister. Uh, I, I thank you, Mr. Speaker, for your, for your guidance, but I think, uh, I think we can say safely how much we sympathise with the, uh, the victim and, uh, and her, her family. Uh, uh, on, on knife crime, uh, it, is a, it is a scourge. Uh, Mr Speaker, and I believe there are many uh, different solutions, but one of them is unquestionably allowing the police to do uh, more stop and search and uh, making sure you have more police out on the street. And that's why we've uh, made the massive investments that we have, and I hope that those investments will be uh, continued, Mr Speaker. I'm sure that they, uh, that they will be. And on, on, on rape and, and serious sexual offences, offences particularly against, uh, against women, this is, in, this is incredibly important to the whole House, and it's something that uh, we have worked on very hard over the last uh, three years. And uh, what, we have, what we have done 
uh, Mr. Speaker, has not only uh, introduced more uh, street lights and, uh, and done everything we can to give our women put, invested more in independent uh, sexual violence advisors and domestic violence advisors and all the people you need to give uh, victims the confidence they need to get cases to trial, which is such a such a problem, uh, Mr. Speaker. But what we've also done, what we've also done. In addition to putting more police out on the streets and, and specialist units to tackle, as we have, what we've also done is introduced a tougher sentences for rape uh, and serious uh, sexual, uh, sexual violence, Mr Speaker. And I have to say, I was amazed, and it's still the case, that his party voted against those tougher sentences. Uh, and that was a great mistake, and I think they should take it back. At the start of Prime Minister's questions, the Honourable Member... Fleece Lothian, Kakoli, and Coden Beef persistently denied the authority of the Chair. In their absence, I wish to proceed to name them and call on the Leader to move the relevant names. So I name Kenny Maskell, Neil Hanvey, and I'm sure now the Leader will pick it up. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I beg to move that Kenny McGaskill and Neil Hanvey be suspended from the service of this House. The question is that Kenny McCaskill and Neil Hanvey be suspended from this House, as many of their opinions say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. We now move to the urgent question. I call West Streeting.